Plato and the ancient origin of NATO, ancient Israelites, and ancient Greeks. Chess. Chess is a board game for two players called white and black, each controlling an army of chess pieces with the objective to checkmate the opponent's king. Let's substitute the word king for kingdom. Chess is a board game for two players called white and black, each controlling an army of chess pieces with the objective to checkmate the opponent's kingdom. Checkmate. Definition and meaning. Merriam-Webster. Checkmate. Definition number one. To block completely. Thought. Definition number two. To check a chess opponent's king so that escape is impossible. The pawn in the game of chess. The pawn is the most numerous and weakest piece in a game of chess. If life is like a game of chess, every move decision you make can either bring you an advantage or a disadvantage, then the pawns are the vast majority of mankind or humanity symbolically. Human life has a beginning, a middle, and an ending, and so does chess. Chess end game. The end game or ending is the final stage of a chess game, which occurs after the middle game. It begins when few pieces are left on the board. Just like the game of chess, human history has an end game or an ending, a beginning, a middle, and an ending or end game. Chess end game. The end game or ending is the final stage of a chess game, which occurs after the middle game. It begins when few pieces are left on the board. The end of history is a political and philosophical concept that supposes that a particular political, economic, or social system may develop that would constitute the end point of humanity's sociocultural evolution in the final form of human government. A variety of authors have argued that a particular system is the end of history, including Thomas More in Utopia, Greg Wilhelm Frederick Hegel, Vladimir Slovlyov, Alexander Kojev, and Francis Fukuyama in the 1992 book, The End of History and the Last Man. The concept of an end of history differs from idea of an end of the world as expressed in various religions, which may forecast a complete destruction of the earth or of life on earth. The end of the human race. The end of history instead proposes a state in which human life continues indefinitely into the future without any further major changes in society, system of governance or economics. In the end of history, in the last man, political scientist Francis Fukuyama predicts a Western liberal democracy as the final form of human government. The model for Western liberal democracy is the United States of America or NATO and the EU. So we could consider Francis Fukuyama narrative based on a secular humanist vision and narrative of mankind.
The polar opposite of the humanist and secular narrative would be the biblical narrative or history. The biblical history predicts the last two ruling global empires would be ruled by Abraham's grandchildren, Jacob and Esau, or their descendants. A descendant of Abraham, Estrus, the Israelite, a prophet, is having a conversation with the Most High about the end of history or the final form of government. Second Ezra, chapter 6, verse 1. And he said unto me, In the beginning, when the earth was made, before the borders of the world stood, or ever the winds blew, then did I consider these things. And they all were made through me alone. The Most High is conversating with Ezra of how he alone made the world. Of course, in the biblical narrative, the Most High Son and the angelic forces are participants in this creation. And through none other, by me also they shall be ended, and by none other. So Esther's questions about the end time are being answered. Or the final form of government perfected. Then answer I and said, What shall be the parting asunder of the times? Or when shall be the end of the first and the beginning of it that followeth? When will the new era, the new age, the new world order, when will this happen? The perfected government. Verse 8, and he said unto me, from Abraham to Isaac, when Jacob and Esau were born of him, Jacob's hands held first the hill of Esau, for Esau is the end of the world, and Jacob is the beginning of it that followeth. Esau's rule will mark the change into a better perfect government. When Jacob rules, that's when the new world order or the perfect government will commence. Abraham's grandchildren would be the rulers of the last two global empires. And the end Jacob was predicted to have the final government or rulership or empire of the world, the end of history. In the Old Testament, in the book of Daniel, Daniel the prophet, the Israelite, was giving similar or the same answer concerning the final form of government for mankind. Daniel chapter 7, verse 23. Then he said to me, This fourth beast is the fourth world power that will rule the earth. It will be different from all the others. It will devour the whole world, trampling and crushing everything in its path. This fourth beast was and is the Roman Empire. Its ten horns are ten kings who will rule that empire. Then another king will arise, different from the other ten, who will subdue three of them. He will defy the Most High and oppress the holy people of the Most High. He will try to change their sacred festivals and laws 
and they will be placed under his control for a time, times and half a time. This is concerning the Roman Empire in the last days and the divisions of that Roman government revised or reborn again. But then the court will pass judgment. And this is talking about the heavenly court. And all his power, the Roman Empire, will be taken away and completely destroyed. Then the sovereignty, power, and greatness of all the kingdoms under heaven will be given to the holy people of the Most High. His kingdom will last forever, and all rulers will serve and obey him. Universal Center for Renovation presents historical and biblical Israelites. This video is strictly for educational purposes and commentary. And this video is of biblical and secular historical literature. So enjoy. Western civilization is divided by two points of views. One point of view is the biblical literature. The other point of view is secular literature or people who have a religious worldview and people that have a worldview based on science. But this is an illusion. There is no divide. There is no difference from biblical and secular literature. There is no divide or division between so-called religious thought and so-called scientific thought. Historical religious literature or biblical literature was written by Hebrew Israelites. Secular literature or science for Western civilization was developed by Hebrew Israelites. There is no division. There is no divide. There are not two opinions, religious so-called or science so-called. It's the same system. On the left is a fresco, a 2,000 year old fresco from the synagogue in Syria, in Dera Europis, showing Moses standing nigh the burning bush. And on the right, from the Roman era, 2,000 years ago, a Greco-Roman scholar. Two sides of the coin, one representing biblical literature, Moses, and one representing science or secular literature, the Greco-Roman man. Isaiah chapter 47, verse four to seven, reaffirms to the Israelites, that there is only one absolute point of view, two different sides or opposition or oppositions of thought. This is to remind the Israelites, there is only one absolute. Verse four, for Jacob, my servant's sake, and Israel, mine elect, I have called thee by the name Israel, I have 
surname thee, though thou hast not known me. I am the Lord, and there is none else. There is no God beside me. I girded thee, though thou hast not known me, protected and guided Israel throughout history, that they may know from the rising of the sun, the east, eastern civilization, and from the west, western civilization. This encompasses all forms of knowledge, history, ideas, people, forms of government. That there's none beside me. I am the Lord and there's none else. Whatever civilization or society the Israelites were in. These different forms of government did not, did not assure the Israelites that there were duplicity in thinking or multiple forms of opinions about history and who runs governments, who controls people. There's only one absolute power. I form the light and create darkness. The Most High, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob controls all sides, biblical and secular. I make peace and create evil. I, the Lord, do all these things. Western civilization, their scholars and scientists were Hebrew Israelites who called themselves Greeks and Romans. So the Apostle Paul warns Timothy of so-called science to not let science, so-called science, confuse his mind when it comes to the biblical narrative. First Timothy chapter six, verse 20. O Timothy, keep that which is committed to thy trust. Avoid profane and vain babblings and oppositions of science, falsely so called. Properly, science was to be used to confirm the biblical narrative. There is no opposition when it comes to the biblical narrative and the scientific worldview. When science is misused, the Apostle Paul called it babbling. Definition number one, babbling. The action or fact of talking rapidly and continuously in a foolish, excited, or incomprehensible way. Babbling. The world seems to be divided by two opinions because the scriptures are twisted and you get religion. Science is twisted and you get secular thought. If these scholars, academics, would actually teach the biblical narrative correctly, you would see there is no divide between religion and science. It all leads back to one point. The biblical narrative or the biblical history and story and outlook and world view. And the definition of religion from Oxford languages, the origin is Latin, religari, to bind. It transformed into Old French Latin, religio, obligation, bond, reverence. Religion, life under monastic vows. It was originally Middle English, originally in the sense life under monastic vows, from Old French or from Latin. Religio, obligation, bond, reverence, perhaps based on Latin, religiacari, to bind.
religion. Religion is a range of socio-cultural systems, including designated behaviors and practices, morals, beliefs, worldviews, texts, sanctified places, prophecies, ethics, or organizations that generally relate humanity to supernatural, transcendental, and spiritual elements. Although there is no scholarly consensus over what precisely constitutes a religion, different religions may or may not contain various elements ranging from the divine sacredness faith and a supernatural being or beings. The origin of religious belief is an open question, not really. With possible explanations, including awareness of individual death, a sense of community and dreams, the idea of awareness of individual death is because in the past, religion was associated with ancestor worship. Religions have sacred histories, narratives, in mythologies, preserved in oral traditions, sacred texts, symbols, and holy places. Symbols because these different religious groups sought to hide the true meaning and beliefs of their systems through symbols. And holy places that may attempt to explain the origin of life. Holy places in ancient times, tombs first served as temples because these ancient religious groups worshipped the dead and may attempt to explain the origin of life, the Genesis story or history, the universe and other phenomena. So we can conclude that these twisting of scripture cause people to have a different outlook on life known as religion and religion is supposed to play the part of opposition to science there are an estimated 10,000 distinct religions worldwide though nearly all of them have regionally based relatively small followings. Four religions, Christianity, Islam, Hinduism, and Buddhism, account for over 77% of the world's population, and 92% of the world either follows one of these four religions or identifies as non-religious, meaning that the remaining 9,000 plus faiths or religions account for only 8% of the population combined. The religiously unaffiliated demographic includes those who do not identify with any particular religion, atheists and agnostics, although many in the demographic still have various religious beliefs. So even atheists and agnostics have beliefs. Evolution is a belief. The word science comes from the Latin word scientia. That means knowing something. It observes and understands phenomena that takes place around us. Science is a rigorous systematic endeavor that builds and organizes knowledge in the form of testable explanations and predictions about the world. Modern science is typically divided into three major branches, the natural sciences, physics, chemistry, and biology, which studies the physical world, the social sciences, economics, psychology, and sociology, which study individuals and societies, and formal sciences, logic, mathematics, and theoretical computer science, which study formal systems governed by axioms and rules. There is a disagreement whether the formal sciences are science disciplines as they do not rely on empirical evidence 
Applied sciences are disciplines that use scientific knowledge for practical purposes, such as in engineering and medicine. The history of science spans the majority of the historical record, but the earliest written records of identifiable predecessors to modern science dating to Bronze Age Egypt and Mesopotamia from around 3000 to 1200 BCE. Their contributions to mathematics, astronomy, and medicine entered and shaped the Greek natural philosophy of classical antiquity. What is called science today was called natural philosophy, whereby formal attempts were made to provide explanations of events in the physical world based on natural causes, not by the supreme being, but based on natural causes. While furthering advancements, including the introduction of the Hindu Arabic numeral system, were made during the Golden Age of India. Scientific research deteriorated in these regions after the fall of the Western Roman Empire. This learning of the Greeks and Romans were suppressed by the Christian Byzantine Empire. During the early Middle Ages, 400 to 1000 CE, but in the medieval Renaissance, Carolingian or Charlemagne Renaissance, Ottonian Renaissance, Germans, and the Renaissance of the 12th century, these were Israelite kingdoms in the Middle Ages or Dark Ages. Scholarship flourished again. Some Greek manuscripts lost in Western Europe were preserved and expanded upon in the Middle Ages during the Islamic Golden Age, rulership of the Moors in Spain, and later by the efforts of Byzantine Greek scholars who brought Greek manuscripts from the dying Byzantine Empire to Western Europe in the Renaissance. The, Med the Medicis, a ruling family in Italy, Israelites, sparked the Renaissance when the Ottoman Turks destroyed the Byzantine Empire in 1453. The fleeing Byzantine scholars who were Israelites went to Italy. The Medicis took them into their school and had them translate ancient Greek manuscripts, and this is what sparked the Renaissance. The recovery and assimilation of Greek works in Islamic inquiries into Western Europe from the 10th to 13th century revived natural philosophy, which was later transformed by the scientific revolution that began in the 16th century. As new ideas and discoveries departed from previous Greek conceptions and traditions, the scientific method soon played a greater role in knowledge creation. And it was not until the 19th century that many of the institutional and professional features of science began to take shape, along with the changing of natural philosophy to natural science. It was first called natural philosophy it was transformed into natural science natural philosophy was developed by israelite greek scholars in ancient and classical greek periods of history the biblical narrative what is now called religion was written by israelite prophets science which was originally called natural philosophy, was invented and developed by Israelite scholars known as Greeks. Or they lived and called themselves Greeks. This divide between religion and science caused people to have divided opinions, such as author Richard Dawkins, author of The God Delusion, 
where he takes a circular humanist side or point of view or world view against the biblical or religious narrative. A quote from Richard Dawkins, being an atheist is nothing to be apologetic about. On the contrary, it is something to be proud of, standing tall to face the far horizon. For atheism nearly always indicates a healthy independence of mind and indeed a healthy mind. There are many people who know and in their heart of hearts that they are atheists but dare not admit it to their families or even in some cases to themselves. Partly this is because the very word atheist has been assiduously built up as a terrible and frightening label. You can understand more about Richard Dawkins' worldview from his book, The God Delusion. The God Delusion is a 2006 book by British evolutionary biologist and ethologist, which means to study animals in their natural habitats. Richard Dawkins. In The God Delusion, Dawkins contends that a supernatural creator, God, almost certainly does not exist, and that a belief in a personal God qualifies as a delusion, which he defines as a persistent false belief held in the face of strong contradictory evidence. He is sympathetic to Robert Persick's statement in Lila, 1991, that when one person suffers from a delusion, it is called insanity. When many people suffer from a delusion, it is called religion. In the book, Dawkins explores the relationship between religion and morality, providing examples that discuss the possibility of morality existing independently of religion and suggesting alternative explanations for the origin of both religion and morality. The biblical Ten Commandments are known as the moral laws. And you also have the civil law, ceremonial law, which includes the high holy days and the law of sacrifice, which is done away with because there's no temple in Jerusalem for sacrifices. But this idea that man doesn't need the Ten Commandments or the moral laws or you can have an alternative moral law is one of the divide between science and religion. Some scientists knew there were no divides between religion and science, such as Joseph Henry. A quote from Joseph Henry read such as, the person who thought there could be any real conflict between science and religion must be either very young in science or ignorant of religion. Joseph Henry, December 17, 1797, May 13, 1878, was an American scientist who served as the first secretary of the Smithsonian Institution. He was a secretary for the National Institute for the Promotion of Science, a precursor of the Smithsonian Institution. He also served as president of the National Academy of Sciences from 1868 to 1878. And he said, the person who thought there could be any real conflict between science and religion must be either very young in science or ignorant of religion. Remember, in the beginning, Science was used to catalog knowledge. It was not supposed to be used to fight against the biblical narrative. The Bible frowns upon the misuse of science. The spiritual ignorant fool has said in his heart, 
there's no God. They are corrupt. They have committed repulsive and unspeakable deeds. Psalm chapter 14, verse 1. Science versus religion. Is it possible? Biblical and secular literature. The authors of both were and are Israelites. Western civilization is divided between religious worldview or religious worldview and a scientific worldview or biblical literature and secular literature. But there is no divide because the authors of both biblical literature and secular literature were both both groups or worldviews were developed by Israelites. And scholars from academia, they know this. In the book From Plato to NATO, my author David Gress, he quotes Martin Bunnell, author of Black Athena, who came to the conclusion that Greek or Greece civilization or Grecian civilization originated from Near Easterners. And these Near Easterners were Israelites. So Greek secular thought that Western civilization originated from were actually Israelites who called themselves Greeks. And this is known by Historians, it's clear information. Martin Banal, author of Black Athena, white scholars had constructed a self-congratulatory image of the ancient Greeks as white Europeans. Greek civilization was indeed unique, but its uniqueness was not due to any native excellence, nor were the Greeks white Europeans. Martin Bunnell, Greek civilization was borrowed from and owed its essence to non-white people, Egyptians and Near Easterners. If the West continued to look to Greece for its origin, it would find these origins were African and Asiatic. Martin Bunnell wrote Black Athena, Black Athena, the Afro-Asiatic roots of classical civilization or classical Greek civilization. It's three volumes, first published in 1987, 1991, and 2006, respectively. It's a controversial book by Martin Bunnell, proposing an alternative hypothesis of the origins of ancient Greece and classical civilization. But now's thesis discusses the perception of ancient Greece in relations to Greece's North African and West Asian neighbors, West Asian meaning Israelites, especially the ancient Egyptians and Phoenicians who are these Israelites who he believes colonized ancient Greece. And Israelites colonized ancient Greece. Bernard proposes that a change in the Western perception of Greece took place from the 18th century onward, and that this change fostered a subsequent denial by Western academia of any significant Egyptian and Phoenician influence on ancient Greek civilization. Homer wrote about this. Herodotus wrote about this. They knew, historians knew about the what they call the Phoenician or Hebrew Israelite influence on ancient Greece. It was only up until the 18th century that this idea was changed. 
Homer was a Israelite. I'm going to prove that later. But the biblical literature and classical Greek literature, which include the natural philosophers or later what we call science, there are only two sides of the same coin. If you say that two things are two sides of the same coin, you mean that there are different ways of looking at or dealing with the same situation. So here you have two groups of Israelites. One, the biblical writers, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Moses, they believe. So they write the biblical narrative. They're inspired. Then you have another group of Israelites who either are agnostic, they don't know, they haven't seen, or they're atheists, they don't believe. But it's two sides of the same coin. One ethnic group writing from two perspectives. One, a perspective of we believe. Another is from the perspective we don't know. The biblical and secular literature was written by the same ethnic group from two different perspectives. Western civilization believes that it has free choice. That's an illusion. The literature and decision-making processes are either from the perspective of biblical literature or secular literature, but it's within the framework of the Hebrew Israelite civilization. Even white supremacy or Arianism falls under this category. There's no escape. This is what you call check mate. There's only one perspective or one side from different perspectives or different angles. There's no escaping a certain worldview, which is an Israelite worldview in Western civilization or in Eastern civilization, as we'll show later. And here's a map of Ionia, which is part of Western Turkey. And this is home of the Ionian Greeks of Asia Minor in Turkey. And as this history will reveal, the great Ionian scholars were Israelites who lived as Greeks. And this is where the School of Natural Philosophers or Scientists was located. Well, this school, this ancient school of philosophy that gave birth to the idea of Western civilization science was known as the Ionian School of Philosophy, the Ionian School of Pre-Socratic or before Socrates, philosophy refers to ancient Greek philosophers or a school of thought in Ionia in the 6th century BC, the first in the Western tradition of scientific thought, the Ionian school. Aristotle, who called them physiologoi or physicists or natural philosophers, they were sometimes referred to as cosmologists since they studied stars and mathematics, astrophysicists, and they gave cosmogonies, which is the origins of the universe and the planet Earth, the stars. They were largely physicalists who tried to explain the nature of matter, materialist. So they explored and broke apart the nature of matter like the atoms, the elements, 
subparticles. They eventually laid the foundation for the atomic age. Now, bear in mind that this history confesses that people like Socrates and Aristotle were Near Easterners, they were Israelites, along with these other philosophers. They came from the land of Canaan, from Israel, originally, and colonized Greece, lived in Greece, and they brought the ideas with them. The Ionian School of Philosophy. Foundation of Western science and technology, such as understanding the atom, building techniques and engineering, such as the pyramids, understanding of subatomic particles, understanding Pythagoras theorem, and other forms of energy and knowledge. Ionian School of Philosophy. Founded from men from the Near East, from Israel, transplanted into Greece. Israelites, the founders of Western civilization, religious system, and scientific system, or biblical literature and secular literature. Now let's go to The Lost Tribes, A Myth by Alan Goodby. So we can prove the presence of the Israelites in Asia Minor or Turkey. Inside this book, The Lost Tribes, A Myth, it provides a map of ancient Turkey, or what is also called Asia Minor. This particular map highlights and locates the ancient Israelite presence in Asia Minor, Turkey. On this map is a state called Q, or region. This is where, according to the map, Solomon horse buyers, King Solomon had trade relations with this particular area in Turkey. These were horse buyers. King Solomon sold horses to the state of Q. Q is in the red circle. King Solomon had trade relations with ancient Turkey. Today, Turkey is part of the Western Alliance, NATO. But not only did the King of Israel, King Solomon, trade with the state of Q that's inside Turkey, but both nations or both groups existed within a trade network that existed worldwide, a global trade network that existed from Britain to Israel, to Greece, Italy, Germany, China, India, Russia, North Africa, Egypt. Not only did this trade network exist, but King Solomon was the head of this global trade network that even went as far as the Americas. Q was an historical place, King Solomon was a historical king. The scientific methods we use to use archaeology and other scientific tools to discover, find out, understand who these people were and how these people lived. Q. There are various spellings of the name Q, also spelled Q-U-E was a Syro-Hittite Assyrian vassal state or province 
during the time of the Assyrian Empire. According to many translations of the Bible, Q was the place from which King Solomon attained horses. 1 Kings chapter 10 verse 28 and 29 2 Chronicles chapter 1 verse 16 The ancient Hebrew Israelites had a long history of relations with Turkey or Asia Minor from the time of King Solomon and before the time of King Solomon. Also, in the same map that could be found in the book, Lost Tribes and Myth, Minoans or the ancient Greeks or ancient Greece and Tarish or ancient Spain or the people of ancient Spain trades with or traded with Israel during the time of King Solomon and before. In this map, I highlighted two regions in red circles. In this book, The Lost Tribes of Myth, this map indicates certain historical activities that the Israelites undertook with other nations. In the circle to the left, it reads Minoans, which means ancient Greeks, or Tadish, which means ancient Spanish. So the ancient Greeks or Spanish, and it reads culture allied with Solomon. The ancient Greeks and Spanish culture was allied with Solomon. The ancient Israelites traded and lived with the ancient Greeks in the ancient people of Spain. And on this same map, to the right, the circle to the right reads Mycenaean port. The Mycenaeans were also another name for ancient Greeks who had a port city or a port area in the land of Israel, Palestine, or Canaan, as it was called. The ancient Israelites had colonies in ancient Greece, had colonies in ancient Spain, had colonies in ancient Turkey, and other places. But I'm highlighting these areas for a reason. When we are talking about Dionian school of philosophy, this map shows Turkey 400 years before the Ionian school shut up shop. Israel was in Turkey since the time and before of King Solomon, and they were in Greece and Spain during the time of King Solomon. This is a map from the book, Collins Atlas of the Bible. Number one is circled the land of Canaan. And number two is circled Mycenae or ancient Greece. And in this map, it shows trade routes by sea that the Israelites and the Mycenaeans took to travel back and forth from the land of Canaan to Greece. And on the map, you can also see to the top, to the right, what is called Anatolia or Turkey, also known as Asia Minor. And this is during the time of King Solomon. King Solomon traded with the Minoans or the ancient Greeks, but the Minoans traveled the world. In this book, The Influence of Stonehenge in Britain on Minoan Navigation and Trade in Europe, How Michigan Copper 
arrived in the Mediterranean during the Bronze Age by Captain Richard de Grassi. The influence of Stonehenge on Minoan navigation and trade in Europe, how Michigan copper arrived in the Mediterranean during the Bronze Age. Tribes of Israel, like the northern tribe of Asher, lived with and traveled the world by sea with the Minoans. They traveled to places like Spain, Britain, France, and the Americas. Anthropologists and archaeologists found many frescoes, paintings that was left by the ancient Minoans, Greeks, of their adventures of sailing around the Mediterranean and the world. The ancient Israelites were with them in these naval expeditions around the world even as far as the South Sea of China. But in this case, we want to highlight or emphasize their travels to the Americas. And also, according to Complete Greek Grammar by John William Donaldson, the Ancient Minoans and Mycenaeans were known as Pelagians, and the Pelagians were known as Swarthy Asiatics or Dark Faced Men. And these Swarthy Asiatics or Dark Faced Men, these Mycenaeans and Minoans, with their ships sailed to North America for copper. To Michigan, and this is a map of the United States with Michigan highlighted. So the Minoans, Mycenaeans, with the tribes of Israel, especially tribes like Asher and Dan, travel to Michigan for the copper. The classical Greeks understood the world the way the ancient Greeks did. The Minoans and Mycenaean maps were left to the classical Greeks 400 years later. And the classical Greeks named the Americas or North America Peroasi, those dwelling around or nearby the Americas. And this is the 2,000 year old map or globe, the spherical earth or the globe of crates showing all six continents. And this to the right is a map in the year 2024 showing all the six continents in the seven seas. The ancient and classical Greeks knew about the six continents and the seven seas. And this information was known to the ancient Israelites who sailed the seven seas and knew and visited the six continents. And in time, during the Assyrian captivity or after, the ancient Israelites colonized North, Central, South America, and the Caribbean, a place where no man dwelt before, but the nations sailed to the Americas for resources like copper. And these are two images of the ancient Greeks, Minoans and Mycenaeans. To the left is from a tomb in ancient Egypt. The ancient Greeks bring in trade and tribute to the ancient Egyptians. And to the right is from Greece 
of ancient Greeks, Minoans and Mycenaeans. These people called historically Pelagians or Swabi Asiatics, dark faced men, known in the biblical history as Javan, sons of Japheth. And these men traveled the seas with tribes of Israel. And this is a modern day interpretation of what these men would have physically looked like, men and women, children of Japheth, children of Japan, ancient Greeks, swarthy Asiatics, dark faced men. As you can see, they resemble Hawaiians, Samoans, men and women from the South Pacific nowadays. It's interesting too that these men and women could actually walk among Latinos such as Brazilians and go unnoticed. And there's a reason for that. And here's a book by Gert Muller that documents the activities of the black origins of ancient Greek civilization. Keep in mind that these black Greeks were from the land of Canaan. They were the Near Easterners of Martin Banal book, Black Athena. These were the ancient Israelites of history. Black origins of ancient Greek civilization. In this book, Gert Muller does an excellent job of showing the ancient archaeology, frescoes, and paintings of the ancient Black Greeks. The ancient Black Greeks with their long hair, their frescoes of their navies. This is an interesting book to read, to understand about the ancient Black Greeks, the ancient Mycenaean Greeks, the ancient Black Greeks were labeled as Phoenicians, but they were Hebrew Israelites. There's much, plenty of records to indicate that these men were Israelites. In his book, The Black Greeks, Gert highlights these black Greeks with long hair. And this is the reason I mentioned long hair, because this statue from Cyprus of an ancient black Greek, he compares that statue to the Brazilian footballer, Ronaldo de Assisi Morea, to show you what these men would have look like physically in modern day times. These black Greeks, like the statue from Cyprus, was an image of an ancient Israelite compared with the Brazilian who are Israelites according to history, archaeology, and biblical prophecy. Ancient Israelites had woolly hair, had straight hair, dark brown skin, light brown skin, different variations of color, different type of phenotypes or facial features. So when we look in history to see what contributions the Israelites contributed to history as far as science, math, Navy, you have to look beyond the surface to understand who these people were and what they represented and what they did in history. Ancient Black Greeks compared with 
modern day Brazilians. Ancient Black Greeks were Near Eastern colonizers from the land of Canaan, Israel, who immigrated into Greece and were the men who were the natural philosophers or scientists of ancient Greece, like Aristotle, Socrates, and Plato, Pythagoras. And this history will prove these things. The Lost Tribes a Myth. This book traces the Israelite diaspora not only in Turkey or Asia Minor, but also in Asia Major. From Palestine to India and China. The Israelite diaspora. Also coming up next, more history and archaeology of the Israelites in the Americas, North, Central, and South America, in the Caribbean. And Europe and Africa. The British Isles or Great Britain will also be part of Europe and this Israelite diaspora or diaspora the Israelite diaspora 